Hey, welcome everybody to the latest edition of True Philadelphian Sportscast. This is our one with the Hive segment. We're back to talk about the Sixers, who are also about to be back for some regular action as they're back in camp and training. But I, have, of course, have my co-host here, Andrew, as you can see, and here for the people that are just listening to us through audio. So how you doing today, Andrew? Uh, very well, thank you, Joe. Um, pretty good day. It's Jersey Thursday, end of the week. Both got jerseys on. I'm rocking Embiid. Um, so, uh, <laughs> this doesn't have anything on the back. It's just an old school, like, you can flip it. It also has the other side, too. Oh, that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but no, it's, I'm excited. I'm uh, coming up to the final end of my last class of the summer. So I've just been working. I've been working on a little... That's part you. of my research paper, so I got a research paper due next week. So I hope to knock out that fully this upcoming weekend. But no, it's going really well. So uh, nothing to complain about. No, that's huge. That's uh, that that's a huge thing when you're about to wrap up your uh, last class of the. So how much classes um do you have left in general? Because you had a two year um program, right, for your thing. It's a two year program. I'm actually ahead of schedule by, since I took four classes this summer. So I only have to take two in the fall, and then I will take one in the spring to keep the contract. And I will um, – I'm graduating in December. I'm just taking that class to keep the contract in the spring and work through all those uh, sports in the spring to continue that experience. And then I'll start applying for other jobs uh, throughout the spring semester. That, that way, hof- hopefully when – this one comes the contract comes to an end in May. I will be able to uh, move move straight into a job, but we'll see with with the with the way the market's going. Yeah, no, that make that makes total sense. No, that's definitely a good idea. But um, we're swing the good idea into <laughs> what we hope leads to good good ideas lead to good success for the Sixers, and we'll start off with talking about the schedule because we have a pretty solid i guess schedule for us i mean could be worse uh could be better i think we definitely don't have one of the hardest schedules i don't know if we have the easiest schedule out of everybody either but um especially because victor oladipo now said that he might decide to play basketball so um that changes things a little bit or a lot of bit really so um what's your first thoughts on the schedule especially due to the fact that i brought up all depot because that's the first game <laughs> so what's your <laughs> thoughts on that whole dynamic honestly it the Sixers got a great schedule in terms of who they have to face there's not many games you're gonna I mean most of these games should be wins I mean unless we'll see how much we all know they struggle on the road so we'll see how much that impacts them it's a quote-unquote neutral location so we'll see how much whether also, I'm interested to see how much the neutral location actually impacts it compared to an actual road game with uh, no fans. But in terms of these teams, there's no reason why the Sixers should not win at least six games, uh, or at least five games uh, at minimum. There's, I mean, if you don't win five games, that, that's not a good start going into right before the playoffs. And, and we'll get into the actual breakdown here in a little bit. But, yeah, when this first comes out, as a fan, you got to be excited because – you don't want to blow off too much steam before the playoffs, so that the schedule allows you to kind of work your way in, work your way into things, get your rhythm going, especially with what we'll talk about later. And you can kind of try things out in these eight games because you're in a spot in the standings where you're fighting for seeding. But I don't know about you. I, I don't know how what to feel about seeding because without anyone having home, home court, the seeding really matter besides who you're facing. So, like, obviously as a fan, we can pick and choose – what team we'd rather face and whatnot, and I'm sure they can as well. But when it's all said and done, everyone's playing in the same gym, no fans. Seeding technically doesn't even matter. So these eight games really truly are to me because you already clinched your playoff spot, and with with only eight games, you already you can't fall lower to wait where you are now. Most you can go up to is the fourth spot. So um, well actually I take that back. You can go up to third if a miracle happened because we're six back of the Celtics with eight games. But obviously, that's most likely not likely to get to that three seed. Um, but no, like I was saying, so it's going to be interesting. In terms of the schedule, though, I love it. You can play with a few things. 
And then right before the playoffs is actually where you play your uh, the two hardest teams you'll face throughout this entire thing. So right before the playoffs, you get your uh, test against the top teams and really get into things. So honestly, I don't think the Sixers could have got a better schedule. No, that makes sense. Yeah, you definitely don't want to start hard and then have the easy people at the end because that can spell a little off for the yeah. playoffs. But – I completely agree with you. I think we have – that's I would rank our schedule still somewhat intermediate because even though the Spurs aren't a good team, they're still coached by a Hall of Famer. They're still going to play you tough no matter what. So I wouldn't put that as a easy as pie game. Like That's like a definite um, – I would put that as a game you should win, but not an easy game against a opponent that wouldn't have been in the playoffs um, otherwise. Like, I, I, I would put that more against Washington, who doesn't have the same coaching aspect and only has Bradley Beal, really, and that's it. Yeah, and it's but. interesting. It's going to be interesting to see who does commit and everything to the, this league because they're not all fully there yet. Uh, as we were talking about beforehand, your first game is against the Pacers, and their best player is questionable. We don't, we don't know. Originally, he automatically rolled, rolled out. himself <laughs> out and then he decided you know what maybe i will play and that's not only your first game so that if you really care about seeding depending on which team you want to face then that first game obviously means a lot because you're facing the pacers you're currently locked up at 39 and 26 with them so that game that game could be quote unquote the most important out of these eight games um that you're gonna have and obviously if if old depot doesn't play there's no reason why the Sixers shouldn't win that game, in my, in my opinion, at least. I mean, you look at the Pacers roster, and their next best player after Old Depot is probably Miles Turner. And, I mean, we can match up with Turner all day. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, Victor Old Depot playing has a big hinder on how that first game, how smoothly that first game could go or how difficult of a battle that first game could be because – we saw how good of a player he's been since he's got to Indiana and taken off when he's been healthy. So obviously he said it though, the type of player he is has never had to deal with that type of injury really. So he doesn't really have much of a sample to go off of. So even coming back, it's going to be interesting to see what percentage of himself he is, uh, like what he looks like and all those all that stuff, because if Victor Oladipo is only playing like half or a little bit more of that than himself, then the Sixers should still be able to beat Indiana. Nah, yeah, I, I agree with you, and and again, it's it's gonna be interesting to see how it plays out and what happens with him. And best best of luck to him. And I mean, whatever he chooses is the right choice. And I mean, it's not easy coming back from the injury he had because I believe it was his Achilles, right? Yeah, yeah, I do. So, yeah, but it was that's why it's big because of the game he plays. He's a quick guard that uses his athleticism, doesn't just shoot. He likes to drive, cut. That's why you don't normally, if somebody has that, that's just a station, more stationary guy or a shooter. You can just be like that, just shoots and doesn't use all the other dynamics. You're like, okay, well, as long as they can still shoot and kind of create their own shot still they'll be fine well depot likes doing a lot that's why he's one of the better players in the game and we see how much an achilles injuries impact the guys in the past so best of luck to him because he was he was fun to watch and i always enjoyed watching him uh even before he we went to the pacers when he was with the uh, thunder yeah yeah he did that that's the other team that he started uh well, right before going to the Pacers, doing really well um, with. But I think the next game we should move into because, like I said, I believe the better matchup, or not the better matchup, but the easier matchup to win is actually against Washington than San Antonio just because of the coaching battle. Um, you're coached by one of the best coaches, obviously. and They always battle where Washington just didn't look great this year and kind of has Bradley Beal. So basically if Bradley Beal drops 40, um, then yeah, they stay in games. If Bradley Beal don't drop about 35 to 40, I don't know how much games Washington's staying in. Uh, they just have that grit still, San Antonio. That's why I feel that game's tougher. I still think we're win it, but I don't want to like guarantee that would be San Antonio like I don't think that's an easy team to beat that's that had a not so good record 
just because of the way they're coached and the way the mentality they still play it. Not to mention that they have some guys coming back. Yeah. It's actually the opposite, though. I'm going to disagree with you because, one, coaching can only get you so far. Two, I'm pretty sure LaMarcus Aldridge has rolled himself out. He's not going to play. And uh, and another guy, I think uh, Lyles, is also uh, a role player for him. He's not going to play either. So they're they're actually down a couple pieces in there, especially with Aldridge. I'm pretty sure, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I think he's sitting out. Um, so with him, with him being out, I, I really don't see a way the Spurs can win this game. Like, I don't, to me, it doesn't really yeah, matter. Yeah, his shoulder, it says he's still out because of his shoulder. That's what so, it says on here. So to me, it, to me, it doesn't really matter who's coaching, uh, for the Spurs. I mean, yeah, they still got DeMar DeRozan, who I think is a fantastic player and he's a tremendous guy, but, uh. I mean that one guy should not be able to overpower a, a team, uh, a team filled with the Sixers in Sem- Simmons and Bead, Richardson and Harris. So I, I would be really surprised if the Sixers found a way to lose this game. And I say the Sixers found a way to lose the game because I feel like if you do, it's a game you'd beat yourself in more than the opponent beat yeah. you. Yeah, I also have to remember I forgot. Um, another guy that probably isn't going to be mentioned in the restart is Beal. So the Wizards are not that good. So both of those teams aren't that good because Beal's yeah. probably not playing. Um, that's, so that's so, three. That should be three straight wins right there. So if Beal's not playing, then I definitely think the Spurs are a tougher opponent because of the coaching mentality. You don't even have the guy that kept you relevant. Uh, that the only reason the Wizards were still relevant was because of Bradley Beal. So Man. that's good. To, but, yeah, I think we should beat both of those teams. I just think the easier game is against Washington, especially remembering that Bradley Beal's out. Uh, I would I would peg that as the easier game. Uh, the Magic, I also think we'll beat them. But uh, what do you feel about that Magic game, which is on the 7th of August? I would say it's it should be another win. I, I know it's... It's an interesting game because I know we struggled with the Magic in the regular season, but I, I really think we'll be better off when we come back now. Um, the, the, it's in Orlando, so I, again, I don't know if that <laughs> if that's going to help them. I, I know it's not in their actual stadium, but obviously, I mean, by game four, it really shouldn't matter in terms of being in the bubble. Um, but no, Magic have some solid guys, role players, but overall, I really don't think... There's anyone to go too crazy about. Obviously, they have a couple former Sixers and Fultz and uh, Nikola Vucevic. And uh, two, or I don't know about Fultz. He hasn't really played much against us. But uh, Vucevic, is a, he's a Sixer killer. I mean, I feel like every time we play him, he's a lock for 20-plus points. He's a lock for close to 10 to 15 rebounds. And so, because he loves it. I mean, I think he's a guy that gets motivated by facing his former team. And... Uh, it's going to be interesting to see, and obviously they still got Terrence Ross and Aaron Gordon, but again, to me, the Magic have uh, a lot of role players, not necessarily guys that should be able to beat you. Um, so I'm going to go with another win, make it four straight. And then I forgot, another sixer on this team is uh, James Ennis. James. Yeah, you can't forget about good old James. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah. But, yeah, no, they definitely uh, – Third team, I think we're uh, beat them, but I also think it helps us. We struggle in the regular season, but we'll get into it obviously later. I think Simmons potentially playing at power forward would help us immensely against a Magic matchup because he's going to be guarding Aaron Gordon uh, probably in that matchup, and Ben Simmons with his athleticism and size can guard Aaron Gordon. So that's yeah, actually no, I agree with you and. No. That's why this seems interesting because they got some names on here. I loved watching in college, and I really think like, this would be a pretty good college roster if you go back in the day. But these guys, just, some of these guys, just haven't transitioned into the right sense. Like, for example, Michael. I mean, Michael, oh, another former sixer, Michael Carter Williams. I mean, <laughs> yeah. he was obviously a great college player. He, I mean, he won Rookie of the Year. He just hasn't transitioned in the NBA the way that people wanted. I mean, Mo Bamba, another good young guy on that team, and I mean, it's one year, so I'm not. You can't like call him anything yet, but kind of still feeling his way in. He played sixty games, only averages five points a game. Um, and then uh, obviously Gordon's a little older now, but 
still fairly young in terms of some of the veterans in the league. And then obviously Foles, he was a fantastic guy to watch. And another guy I liked coming into the draft, I'm not ready to give up on him yet because I do like, I mean, he averages 12 points a game, which isn't bad. I don't know if he's playing, though, because I think he dealt with an injury during the season. So I don't know if he's back. But Jonathan Isaac, or Jonathan Isaac, is a, he was a fantastic player in college. And uh, it took him a little bit, but he, he started doing fairly well before his injury, I think. I think he missed the last 20 plus games so again magic have a, a good fun named roster but in terms of in terms of this league or in terms of the season i don't yeah. see why the Sixers lose that game no i don't think they do either now here is the first game that could be deemed even though they didn't play up to their roster structure but obviously they have some pretty decent names on their roster the portland trailblazers uh what do you feel about our matchup with the trailblazers like i said they're a roster that kind of downplayed to what they actually could perform. No, I Some of that had to do to injuries. But. I agree with you 100%. I, uh, I honestly think this, you can make the argument, I think this would be my pick for uh, most disappointing team in the uh, NBA. I, I really thought they were going to be a, a lot better, and I really think they should be a lot better. Because, uh, I mean, you mentioned it. When you, guys, when you have guys like Damian Lord and... Uh, CJ McCollum on your roster starting. I mean, to me, for you, for them to have to fight for a playoff spot here, it's just, I don't know. It just feels weird because, like, they should have been better than the Thunder, in my opinion. They should have been better than the Jazz. The they Rockets. Been better than the Thunder. The Thunder, Chris Paul came in there and played, like, the old CP3 for part of this year to get them to where they're at. Right? <laughs> and then the Thunder, a good, fun team to watch, and... Uh, but no, going back to the, the Trailblazers, but I, I know they dealt with some inju- or an injury, like you said, uh, but they had a good guy to fill in right there. And, I mean, Whiteside, even though you're missing your starting center, you make the trade for Whiteside, and you think you're not going to miss too much of a B because, I mean, Whiteside's a pretty good center to kind of come in there and fill in. And uh, then you bring in, like, Carmelo Anthony, and in, in later in the season, you have a veteran in Trevor uh, Ariza, Rodney Hood. I mean, we all know his game he went off in the playoffs last year in that overtime game <laughs> um but no so that's why I, this team it, this team for some reason i don't know what didn't click for him but i was disappointed with them because i always find them a lot of fun to watch but yeah again with their struggles and everything and with everything going on and bead usually dominates white side uh simmons should be fine in this game they don't really have anyone to guard simmons I mean, just such a big size they mismatch They could go there. with double matchups since he's supposed to be bad. It's not a good matchup on paper because none of them is a power forward. But they could put Nurkic at the four and just go big and hope for the best to match up against us. But that's not a great matchup they, decision either. But They could go with that. And honestly, I would love that because I don't see a way he shuts down. Um, I don't see... I don't see a way he shuts down anybody in the sense of uh, – and, and Simmons, because Simmons should uh, should be quicker. Like, as mm-hmm. good as he is for de- defensively – Especially coming off an injury. Yeah, for defensively, he should be a slower guy, which is going to – which to me is tough. And maybe – because I really don't think – same with – Whiteside would be an interesting matchup, but I think they'd rather him on Embiid. Whiteside's the better defender. Uh, but it's – I just don't see how the – uh, Trailblazers match up with the Sixers very well, and that's yeah. why I like it. Because even if you keep going, I mean, I take at this point, especially, I take Harris over uh, Carmelo. I mean, Josh Richardson yeah. it comes in for his defense. We all or doesn't come in. He starts, and he's well known for his defense. So he should. I'm not going to say he's going to be able to shut down uh, Damian or McCollum because obviously it's not going to be easy. But whichever one he guards, uh, he should be able to play with them. And this this is where it gets interesting. I'm interested to see. Uh, it's funny to keep going on this because it's obviously not going to be the playoff matchup. But it'd be interesting to see how we match up with them because it's almost – if they go big, it'll be interesting to see how we go big as well. Uh, and we'll get into it later, but with Horford coming off the bench, this is a game you could maybe use Horford to come back and play a little more minutes in other games. And if you do that, you could have Simmons guard Damian Lillard or C.J. McCollum with yeah. Richardson – and I think that would really bode well for, for the Sixers I completely in that sense agree defensively. With you. I completely agree with you, but you just brought up real quick 
before we get into the final three games, a good two-minute side topic. Al Horford, per reports that I've read since he's come back in, has really taken on a leadership role on this team, and his teammates have complimented how much he's really stepped up in the locker room and really to establish great rapport because of you know as a veteran you want all the veterans to step up in this odd situation to keep everyone comfortable and he's done just that and more it seems so I don't know uh, what your comments are on that but it seems like obviously he struggled a bit this season for us more than we would have hoped but this could kind of be his rebounding time to really show us what he actually is having his time to be able to be a leader and really be comfortable I think it's huge with that question. I think it's something this team really lacks in the sense of, I mean, you go down this list and I mean, yes, I know they've been in the league for the last couple of years, but Simmons in terms of leadership, he's young and Bede's young. Richardson's young. Harris is young. I mean, you got a bunch of guys that are all around the same age, kind of the young type veteran, not the true veteran. So I don't think anyone really speaks up. I don't really think it means anything, but now you have, Al Horford, who's been a proven star in this league, finally kind of taking that leadership role. And maybe it's kind of the way when you when you feel out of a new place, you don't know what type of a leadership kind of to take in that because you don't want to overstep your boundary kind of coming in and, and, and start bossing people around when you've been there for two games while obviously Simmons and Embiid and uh, company have been there for a while. So I think this kind of – and I, I said it I think on the last time we did a Sixers podcast is – this time really should get this team going because I really love the chemistry they probably developed in this whole thing. And when you bring in a couple new role players in Burks and Robinson, that like that's why I really think the Sixers one was the most beneficial team from this whole thing, especially with, with the way their injuries went. And now you're going to get everybody back healthy and what we've heard kind of be- better than ever this season. So I'm, I'm excited and really thrilled to hear him kind of take that leadership role because even with the – it's technically a demotion going from the starting lineup to the bench. So good for him to kind of take that that role. Yeah. No, I think he just knows he wants to walk. Horford's also a winner and a, can, one of the utmost competitors in the game. So he wants to win. So he's going to do what it takes and he feels falls into place for that. And obviously having the rotation we have, we saw Ben play little there and we'll get into that more later i think that's a best idea so he knows he's going to do what's best for the team but uh now we can wrap it up with the one more easier game before we get into the two final harder games which for some reason the final game uh from what i've seen on the schedule at least they decided to release all the times for every game but the final game um don't ask me why but anyway uh, what do you think against the Suns, which would be on the 11th at 4.30 in the afternoon? Yeah, I think, real quick, that's one of the funny parts is the times they have for these. It's not going to be every a night game every day. It's going to be uh, yeah. wide, wide throughout the day. So that's no, gonna but be why, why not that last game? It's like, no, I, agree. Every maybe, game. I was thinking maybe playoff <laughs> concerns, but I think both yeah. teams are already clinched, and they're in the opposite conferences, so seeding won't matter. So I, I don't know. And maybe... That's probably what it is. We're probably waiting to see what happens for that eighth spot because if uh, obviously if there's a fight for a playoff, they'll probably make that the prime time game. That's the only thing I can think that's of. That's a good. That's a good point. Yeah. But to keep this one short because it's the Suns, um, Sixers should win this game as well. Uh, I, there's not much on the Suns team. I don't think Booker's guaranteed to play either. Is yeah, it? Booker's not guaranteed to play. Um, obviously this is kind of like the magic. You have a lot of fun names on there, but in terms of actual talent right now, I'm not saying deep down later, they'll be, they won't be as good. Cause I love Cameron Johnson out of North Carolina. I think he's a fantastic player. Uh, might be a little biased here, but Michael Bridges, I, I really like him. Wish the Sixers would have kept him rather than trading him. Uh, obviously Dario. Dario Sar- yeah. Uh, he's obviously former Sixer, but and then Frank Kaminsky, again, they got a bunch of fun names. But Oubre's terms, pretty good. Yeah. Oubre's not a bad player. Yeah. Not bad. But in terms of talent, I really don't see how the Sixers lose this game unless Booker plays and drops about 70 points. No, yeah, they're not They're not going to lose this game. I don't even know if they'll lose in that factor because you're still going to have to have a lot of young kids score the rest of the like good amount of points. And I'd be like, yeah, we scored 30 total points other than Devin Booker. And then it's like, 
that's great. So you're telling me that you guys scored 100 total points when a guy scored 70. It's like, yeah. It's like, well, that's absolutely terrible. Right. <laughs> oh, so that's why I don't even know if Thrabito's even in that in that factor. That might be one of those games like Kobe had, um, rest in peace, but those games he would score 56, and it's like, and the Lakers lose, and you're like, excuse me? Um like that you just like that just doesn't ever make sense to me how like a team can't score enough when a guy scores over 50 to win the game that always is something that always annoys me but anyway so now everyone knows what a pet peeve in basketball is of mine so <laughs> we can uh move into the two hardest matchups for the Sixers and that is the Raptors who of course beat us with that absolutely lucky shot last year no one's going to get me to say that wasn't lucky. Kawhi Leonard's a great player, but that was lucky. Bounced a bunch of time. Um, and then the Rockets is the last opponent. But the Raptors one is right now announced, and it's going to stay that way, I would assume, on 8-12, the 12th of August at 6.30 p.m. So how do you think we're going to fare against the Raptors? I think it's going to be an excellent game. I, I really, th- um, I really don't think the records show these two teams. Like I, 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 I you can call me biased or whatever, but I really don't think it's being biased, but I, I really don't think the Raptors are nine games better than the Sixers. I really don't believe that. And I mean, you look at the, you look at the uh, Toronto's team and don't get me wrong. They got some good players on there. Obviously Siakam's turned into a fantastic player yeah. and everything. And obviously Kyle Lowry has been a, a known veteran. He's been an all-star multiple times. Um, then you got uh, Van, Fred Van Vliet off the. I think he still comes off the bench. I, I forget if he starts now. But uh, they have a Baca who has experience for the postseason, so yeah, that's helpful. And, yeah. and that's it's a tough situation. Uh, I'm. It's a team that usually has the Sixers number. This year they were pretty split, if I remember correctly, from the regular season. Because Marcus Sol doesn't match up as well against that beat. That was a big factor too. Marcus mm-hmm. Sol compared to. Um, when they had why am I blanking his name Valchunas yeah it doesn't match up as well that's a big factor so this is a closer game I'm gonna lean win because I think in a neutral setting and everything I just I think the Sixers just I got a lot of hope and I know I know I've said it but I don't Sixers match up better than they match up with us like. Mm-hmm. And this could be a potential series, so we might have to break it down fully in depth. But like, I don't know who's guarding Embiid anymore. Like, Abaka's that's not exactly. That's that's why I brought that up. Yeah, Even, I don't know who's guarding Embiid. I don't know who's guarding Simmons, because I guess Siakam could maybe give him some trouble. Um, but I mean, then then you go at this point in their career. I'm taking Harris over Kyle Lowry and Josh Richardson over anyone else from their kind of lineup. So, I. And that's why I'm surprised, and credit to the coaching staff for getting them the way they are. But I'm surprised how well Toronto's done this year that with losing Kawhi. So I, I'm going to go Sixers win and uh, move on to 7-0. and Yeah, like I said, I think uh, they'll figure that out because of them getting rid of Valchunas. I don't think they realize how much that affects them against us in a series. Having Gasol, Gasol doesn't match up as well as a bulldoze defending type guy, obviously, against Embiid where Valchunas would kind of piss him off sometimes, where Gasol doesn't really do that. And Serge Ibaka used to have the ability to do that more before he had some injuries in his career and is now a good player, but just a very solid player and not what he used to be with Thunder. So I don't think they match up. I think I that's why I agree with you. I think we're going to win that game. But that'll bring us into the final game when we're either going 7-1 and one, or eight and zero. Oh. So this is about as positive as our Eagles video went when we predicted the uh, Eagles schedule. So um, we are coming into the Rockets. That game is not announced yet on what time it will be at, but it will be on the fourteenth of August. That I will obviously say is our toughest opponent, in my opinion, at least. I don't know about you. Uh, who do you feel comes out on top of that one? I'm gonna pick Houston in this one. Um... Not that the Sixers can't win this game. I think it should be similar to Toronto where it's going to come down to the final minutes and it could be anybody's game, anybody's win. Um, But, I mean, the Sixers are going to come in on a seven-game win streak. 
not to say you can't win eight, but I think it's difficult. I think this is a good game to that they might just kind of fall. Going to the playoffs, it won't mean anything in terms of uh, anything in the conference because it's at a conference game. You want everyone to go into the playoffs healthy at this point. Again, you already clinched everything. Uh, you already clinched your playoff spot. You're, again, the seeding doesn't matter as much because there's no home court. So this game, honestly, I think this game you'll see both teams kind of manage it this way. Well, you'll see the power players kind of deal with a lot of this stuff in the beginning, kind of give them a, a final game into the playoffs. And I really think in the back end, you could see some guys getting some rest just to make sure they go into uh, into the playoffs healthy, especially with uh, the virus going around and everything. But when you break down these two teams, obviously Harden and Westbrook uh, stars on that team. We have team. to remember Westbrook is still coming back from the – virus they so. both are actually so yeah. that it could affect and, them, and but, james harden yeah both are yeah you're right um but yeah and eric gordon is not a bad player clint capella is not he's a good player i like covington off the bench there for him uh, defensively and then to mix in with a few shots uh so I, this team can go pretty deep and that's i think that would that's what scares me with them with the sixers and and they can match up pretty well with the sixers i mean Obviously, I'm going to take a beat over Capella, but Capella's not a bad center. He's a pretty big guy. Uh, and then uh, different thing. I mean, obviously, what Westbrook Harden mix up mass mix match well with the Sixers. I, I'm interested to see if they do ever. I mean, say they both go to the finals. I don't know what they match up wise with Simmons and all them. But you can't. You're not going to go eight and zero probably. So I'm I'm going to lean Rockets in this game. And actually, as I was talking about Clint Capella, I realized he's no longer on the uh, Rockets. So, uh, <laughs> my bad on that one. No, you're good. You're good. Um, obviously, that happens, and it happens to everybody. I remember when it happened on a first take when Stephen A. called three people that weren't <laughs> on a team in football how good they were going to do this season for that team. And Max is like, wait a minute. Uh, and then he's like, wait a minute wait a minute <laughs> like three separate times in the same set <laughs> but, no I, I remember that yeah but, that, but um i'm trying but, to remember uh, who their center say, is now they like. have a name it's um <clears throat> tyson chandler oh okay i guess i didn't realize that. i'm gonna keep the rockets but that makes me feel better about winning a game because there's no way tyson chandler's garden <laughs> Do they have? I just looked at the last box score. I think Chandler didn't play. I don't know if he was hurt or not. Yeah. But their starting center, if you want to go by height. Yeah, didn't they put. Talk, like, they, they used to if run. If you want to go by height, their starting Antonio center is. Small. Their starting center is technically Covington. Okay, yeah, that's who they. I knew, I knew they put somebody weird there because he always ran a small lineup because they got rid of Capella, then they brought in um, Chandler, who's just kind of a solid rebounder defender at this point of his career. He only played twenty some games out of the whole grouping of games we still played this year before the stoppage. So, uh, yeah, that gives. But I still think I got to go kind of with where I went with the Eagles schedule. If you go seven and zero, if the other teams struggle, you're going to be in a position where you might not overplay. You're uh, top guys at that point, too. And then if the Rockets are in a position in sixth uh, where they're not, maybe they didn't go 7-0, and they, especially with, uh, we pray that Russ is able to come back quickly um, for the overall NBA. And then Harden, of course, checked in yesterday, I think it was. Might have been today. It was either yesterday or today. Um, so that's a big factor where they're at energy wise um coming into this playoff. But I think that's gonna be the one loss similarly to what I said in the Eagles. You're gonna have guys probably resting if you go seven or no, because you're probably gonna put yourself in a really good spot. But now we can move into something we kind of hinted at a few times, which is the fact that for this postseason and also the regular season, how much moving Simmons likely, not known yet, but likely to power forward position and having shake at the point guard position will help us. And Simmons already says he basically doesn't look at things as a position. He looks at it more of just basically paraphrasing playing his game. Um, so what do you think about that whole move? You know that I was someone that when we first did that, I immediately loved it. So obviously you know that I 
have no issue with this idea and I'm all for it. So I'm very interested to hear what <laughs> your your thoughts are on it. I think it's a great move. I this is something that obviously they went into this bubble period or break period and both teams or not both teams. Uh, the Sixers were scratched and they're looking for answers. I mean, you ask anybody in that clubhouse, you ask any uh, reporter, you ask any fan, everybody would have picked the Sixers to be higher than a six seed. So you get into that stoppage, you know it's been a disappointing year uh, to what you were expecting. Um, again, the Sixers are saved by this because now they don't have to play on the road in, in a road matchup. Um, but th- this move is perfect, and I trust Brown and what he's seen. Uh, he's very high on Simmons and what he's been doing now. Uh, we see how much – I'm not getting fooled by it, but everyone's going crazy about the amount of threes he's shooting in practice and the scrimmages we've seen. I'm not I, – I've been fooled enough by it already, so I'm not going to buy into it until I actually see it uh, translate into games. So I think – but it opens up many opportunities, and it's not like you're keeping the ball away from him. If Ben Simmons gets the rebound – He's going to attack the break. He's going to lead the break. It's not like, oh, Simmons got the rebound. Milton's quote-unquote the point guard, so he's got to take the ball up. Simmons will take the ball up still multiple times. It's not like you're going to be strictly to shake Milton. But this is going to offer It's going to offer a lot, and it's going to open up more game. Because now if you move Simmons, if you move him to wherever and you try to go inside or something with him and he uses quickness, you're going to open up shake Milton. And it's, it's funny – how much Shake Milton could be the game changer for the Sixers team? I mean, he came in in the G League like to start the season, and now he he could be the biggest role player on this team outside of the obviously key four. Uh, he could be the biggest player into leading this team to the NBA Finals or wherever they go. But to also say the same thing, he could be the reason why this team doesn't get past the first round. <laughs> So, like, Shake Milton's yeah, got a lot yeah. riding on his hands because yeah. he's going to get the shot opportunities, and if, if he can't knock them down, you're going to be looking to other guys. And and obviously, if he's struggling, they'll probably switch it around. But this is what I was alluding to earlier. Like, this, this is why it's a perfect situation for the Sixers in the schedule. These eight games, you can play with it. We'll see how well it works. And if it doesn't work, you can change it going back into the playoffs because we already know – we already know the other style, other style of basketball, and we'll be fine that end. Um, now this allows you to move uh, Al Horford to the bench, which I think at this point in his career, or maybe it's just the role with the Sixers, it's going to not only help the Sixers, but help him as well, keep his legs underneath him. I love it in the sense of, I mean, I, Mike Scott isn't what he used to be. So now that you have Horford coming off the bench, you don't have to, you don't have to play Mike Scott no. at all, let alone – the amount of minutes he was playing and nothing against him. Cause he's obviously a fan favorite and everyone loves him. And obviously we have this named after him. So obviously he's a fan favorite, but at this point, the way he struggled, you're going to turn, this allows you to make an eight to nine man rotation, which is your typical playoff rotation. And it's going to allow you to keep guys off. Cause now you have, when you started Horford, you were kind of forced to play Scott to give and beat and Horford rest. Now, the way you mix and match it, moving Simmons down to the four, you can just you can mix and match a three man rotation in height of Horford, Simmons, and Bead, and you'll end up being fine. And now you can rely on those sharp shooters and in uh, uh, Tobias Harris, Josh Richardson, Shake Milton to start. They're gonna have to hit shots and off the bench. Hopefully, Burks and Robinson and or Corkmas, whoever kind of wins that rotation spot, they'll be able to knock down shots. And I have confidence in them, and we saw it in the regular season. And now now they'll get more shots. So I, I'm really excited to see how the Simmons move uh, plays out, because I really think it could go a long way. I completely agree. I think also what you said with the whole roster um, as a whole um, really talks about it, because like I said before we started recording, if we go 7-0, and it's a likelihood that more than six to eight guys could have, you could have had eight to ten guys step up then and then you have a good problem because you're like well normally you run an eight to nine man rotation like you said in the playoffs but if you had ten guys play really well you're probably not going to want to just outcast somebody and be like well you're just the odd man out so that kind of stinks for you it's like 
well, what the hell did I do? It's like nothing. We just don't want you to play anymore. It's like, oh well, like you don't, like you, you like that's a that's a great problem to have. Obviously, if you can run a ten man set successfully, that would actually be a benefit in the postseason because you would have pre- the freshest legs um, compared to the other team. So that would actually be a good problem if that presented itself. And I'm really interested. You mentioned the ten man rotation. I'm really interested to see where they go with it because I don't know how they're going to choose because the the hard part with some of these guys, like obviously it's count them out. Embiid, Locke, Simmons, Locke, Harris, Locke, Richardson, Milton, Horford, they're locks. Those are your six locks. I think Burks would be a lock at seven because I think he's better than Robinson. Now you're looking at eight to nine minute rotation, possibly ten like you said. You have guys like Glenn Robinson who is obviously streaky. Furcon's going to be streaky and a liability on defense. So mm-hmm. That's where that gets interesting. Mike Scott obviously has struggled the most he's ever yeah, struggled in his Scott's career, probably. Yeah. And then another interesting candidate who's been kind of off and on with fantastic before his injury, kind of off and on after the injury, is the rookie Matisse Thibel, which is quickly became a fan favorite. Everybody loves the guy. I mean, he's hysterical. I don't know how you can't like him. So those four guys got to fight for – possibly one to two spots, maybe three, which would be a stretch. And you might be able to get away with it in the first round, depending on who you get matched up with. But I really think once you once you get to, if you get to the second round and you kind of go up against that Toronto team or Milwaukee team, whatever, wherever, wherever you're seated, you're going to face Milwaukee or Toronto second round. I don't know if you can go that deep into 10. Again, if you get matched up, I... I it's 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 really gonna be interesting because the matchups. Well, are be the, the reason best I'm part, saying but... if it works, it could benefit you is if it works and you're able to do it well and give somebody even like four or five minutes to spell somebody, that's gonna make guys have the freshest legs compared to the other team that's only running a seven to eight nine man, yeah, max no. rotation. So that's kind of more of the side I was looking at it from. And I agree with you and. I but I do for, see with Ferk, Ferk's the most interesting in the postseason. Can he shoot? Yes, but he can't defend at all, which is a big concern in the postseason, which is why I feel because Robinson's not just a three-point shooter. Like, when you watched him, uh, he's also a guy that tends to shoot from within, like, around the foul line and mid-range as well. You might want a guy that kind of does that in the play. And also, obviously, Glenn Robinson is solid on defense. He's not great, but he's a... Uh, Solid on defense, where Furk uh, needs to really develop that end of his game. That should be his primary focus this offseason. And this yeah. is where this is where it's going to rely a lot, and we'll see how it plays out. But I think it's going to be heavily on coaching, because I think honestly, if, if the way I would do it is you got to play matchups. In my opinion, I would go in with a strong seven-man lock rotation. Like I said, I think it ends at Burks. Then after Burks at seven, I think you just got to play matchups. If it's a game, and you'll get a feel in the beginning of the game, or you even get a feel with the series you're in. If it's a game you need scoring, I, I trust Furk on it to hit a shot more than Glenn yeah. Robinson. That's if, it's, if it's a series where, oh, and Bede, Simmons, and all them are doing fine, you're scoring like crazy, but you need a couple stops, that, then you mix in Glenn Robinson or even Thibel, because Thibel is known for his defense, and he was probably one of the best defender, defender, defending rookies in the league um, with the way he's able to steal and block shots. So, I mean, not, again, I love Thibault, but I'm not trusting his offensive game yet. And yeah. I, we'll see way he develops in the offseason, which I think he can. And we're trying to get him to be that spot corner three guy. But, again, if it turns into an offensive game, I lean Furcon. But if it's if it turns into a defensive game, uh, I trust Robinson if you need a stop gotcha. or something. I also was going to say on the Glenn side, though, he might be a player you want in the postseason because he's a guy that – uh, when they traded for him, they said this about a type of player. He was here before we brought him back. He's a guy that doesn't have all the skill, all the athleticism in the world. He's one of those guys that just tries to one th- run through a brick wall, in a sense, for you to be his best self. Where having like, oh, he's almost like that TJ McConnell type energy type guy if he's really playing his best for your team. So having that in the postseason is also like a kind of added element that you would might potentially want. But I also like Furcon shooting when he gets hot. But the problem is it depends on the matchup because if there's sort of matchup, there's no chance Furcon can really play much because he'll get torched by the fellow shooting guard. So like how much he scores will not balance out. 
probably how much he allows by his counterpart. Like against the Rockets, there's no chance you can really play Furcon much because there's he's he can't match up against James Harden. So Yeah, I think the or role Harden. I think the role Robinson's gonna play is it's fine. I think he almost reminds me of a James Ennis. Like That's Robinson, a high energy guy too, so that works. Robinson's gonna be the guy last year we obviously saw in the playoffs. Sixers didn't get much bench help in that playoffs, and that's why we lost. But Ennis was weird. Like, he was a guy no one expected, but for whatever reason, and obviously he struggled at different times, but he stepped up for the most part in the playoffs, and he was just kind of that sleeper guy. And, and honestly, the game seeded really well. The Sixers performed better, and obviously when he struggled, you didn't get much help from your bench. Obviously, I think this year's completely different. I love the bench a lot more than what we had last year. But I think Glenn Robinson could be that sneaky guy that might – step up and if he's hitting shots because he's he's a streaky guy and that's what you get out of a shooter so if he's able to step up and do some of those things it could go a long way but i mean when you i mean you compare this bench to last year's team you're just so much better off i mean al horford over greg uh greg monroe or boban i mean and amir johnson i'm taking horford all day yeah um mike scott's obviously back i think you obviously I mean, correct me if, I, if you disagree, but I think you obviously have a lot better fur con than last year. I mean, I think I trust him 10 times more than I would have trusted him last year. Um, nothing against TJ McConnell, but I like Matisse Thibel, Glenn Robinson over him. Um, I, I don't already, like Raul Nato over him, though. So if we had him over Raul Nato, I would definitely. But see, that's a guy, we didn't even mention him, and I just don't, like, I don't think there's any way he gets me. Yeah. No, he doesn't. He's not. Now with the way that shakes uh, platoon and into the um, – they also had Jay Rich bring it up when healthy at times. There's no chance that. Yeah, Bro. so I just – and same with, like, a guy – and it would be interesting to see if, if he gets any – and I don't see why he gets minutes unless foul trouble. But you also – I think, what, you get to seat 14, I think? I believe so, yeah. So to round those out, you'd expect – after Thibault, all the guys you mentioned at 11 – you have Kahlo Quinn will probably be 12. Raul mm-hmm. Nito will probably be 13. And then it'll be interesting to see where they go if a fourth. Oh, well, what's the guys? They're hoping. We didn't even talk about this. This Mario, is another guy. Shayok. What was it? Shayok. I love Shayok. I think he's going to be a fantastic player. I don't expect him to make the roster. Well, the curveball is I'm blanking on the guy, uh, but. It's um the guy we signed from the Mavericks, that sharpshooter power forward that right now isn't with the team because he's uh, with his wife who had COVID. Oh, Ryan Brokoff. Yeah, Ryan. So I mean, he the, he should be able to step in and do some damage if he if he gets the right feel if he can play. I'm hoping he can because I've heard a lot of good things about him. So uh, if yeah, he, he comes back, he, who knows percent. if he gets minutes? So yeah. this Sixers team can go deep and it's going to carry him a long way. Yeah, that kid was really good in uh, college. He was one of the better shooters. Um, I remember when we traded for him, I, not traded for him, signed him, I looked at his uh, numbers, and he had ridiculous shooting numbers that were in the high. I think some years he was in the 40s, and then other years it was at least high 30s, but most years it was 40s, and he was killing it there. And then he showed some signs of being able to shoot in the NBA. So he's a good pickup, especially for a team that wants shooting. Um, so... I hope he's able to play as well. But in terms of our final topic between Josh Richardson and Tobias Harris, of the two role players, who do you believe the Sixers need to have step up the most for them in this postseason to go the deepest into this postseason? The way I look at it is... You know what you're getting offensively. I think you know what you're getting out of uh, Richardson. Uh, a fantastic defender, a two-way player. He'll be there. Uh, I think the guy that's got to step up, and you know I've defended him like crazy all year, and it's the guy that uh, you gave that next contract to. I mean, it's got to be Tobias Harris, in my opinion, because a lot of these matchups we're going to see in the playoffs uh, – Harris is going to have to step up on the defensive end. I think he, he improved tremendously from last year, in my opinion. I think his defense this year compared to last year was huge, highly noted by me at least, uh, how much better he did. But when you look at some of these teams matching up, 
you're going to be matching up against. They have they have key guys all over, but their role players are going to be that small forward spot as well. So, like, if you look at, I mean, it's, let's take like a first round matchup against the Heat. We already went. We we are or actually we didn't talk about the Heat because we're not playing the Heat. Um, the Heat. It's actually funny. The two teams <laughs> we're going to get matched up with. I don't know if they plan that, but the the two likelihood teams you'd face in the playoffs, you don't get in this regular season. They say game regular season, but if you break them down, I mean, you you take a look at the. Uh, let's take. I mean, take a look at the Heat. Jimmy Butler is going to be the, the small forward. And if you when Simmons plays the four, it's gonna be interesting to see what they do on the defensive end. Cause me personally, I think I'd I'd like to see uh I mean I'd like to see Simmons guard Butler, I think. I think he'd have the best shot at trying to stop Butler. Um but when you I would agree. When you look at some of the other guys and on that team and you're gonna get I forgot they signed Andre Godala. Um a lot of for, <laughs> a lot of former sixers in this playoff. Uh but anyway. You look at their team uh, and, and what they have, and Jay Crowder, Andre Godalis from that forward spot. Uh, Miles Leonard, a uh, pretty good player, or has done well. It's going to be interesting to see that, what Iggy is at this point. Yeah, it's going to be. And I'll, yeah. it's, it, you're right. But, uh, you, yeah, you go to them. You look at the Celtics when they got uh, Tatum. They got um, Kemba Walker if he plays. Obviously, they got Marcus Smart. They got a lot of guys, too. But – you like, well, I guess what I'm trying to say is, Sixers. I think lived in and Harris stepped up a lot of times when Embiid and Simmons were out for that stretch of games. And I, I believe in Harris. I think he his consistency would go a longer way for the Sixers more than a Richardson consistency. Um, because even when even if Richardson struggles and say he only puts up 12 points or whatever, he doesn't let that affect his defensive game. So you know what you're getting out of that. When you if, if you can't get what you need to get from Harris, not that his defense won't be there, but his defense isn't high enough to pick that up. So, I, I and I think it's gonna go, obviously with Milton and stuff we'll trust too. But I think a lot's gonna ride on Harris, and I think a lot of key shots are gonna come out of his hand in the playoffs. So I'm going with Tobias Harris. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can't score almost 20 points per game if you. How some people said, "quote unquote" on Twitter, stunk all season. Um, exactly, that's a, that's a little bit difficult to do. Um, that's like saying someone averaged like a half point per game in hockey, and you're like, "Well, you stink." It's like, well, no, they really don't. It's just maybe they average a point per game in their whole career, and then now because they have one down season, you're like, "Oh, they just stink at the entire sport." It's like, no, that's. <laughs> <laughs> That's not how that works. Um, it just means that they didn't shoot to their normal percentages, but they still averaged 20. So if you're going to take a year of maybe not shooting to your normal percentages, I'll take averaging 20. Like I said, if that's your down year, like I always say and stuff, I'll take that as your down year shooting about 36 from three and averaging 20 points, especially now having this new camp kind of almost – like I know Jamie uh, at Flyers Nitty says with hockey, but it's the same with basketball. It's almost like a new season because you were away for so long. You're coming into a new camp. That's really going to help everybody to readjust and really figure out what they need to fix and fine tune. And I'm sure somebody with the work ethic of Tobias was doing that the entire time for the most part. No, yeah, with that question, and he had seven rebounds with that and, so I'll take that all every day if that's your down year. Um, and who knows what he's going to do in the off season? I remember this past off season, Harris went all out and did a lot of work to get ready. So I'm excited. It's yeah. not going to be as good of an off season, obviously, with the delay to this season and everything. Um, but no, I, and here's the other thing, and this is why I also say Harris, especially if you get matched up to with the Heat, because whether you win or lose, if you win, I can already picture this. If you if the Sixers beat the Heat. Everyone's going to rave about how well the Sixers did in the offseason, how much he was worth that contract and over Butler. But let me just say this. If Jimmy Butler and the Heat beat the Sixers, Tobias Harris, I, I love <laughs> Harris, and I will not be saying this, but if Jimmy Butler and the Heat beat the Sixers, I feel bad for Harris because he is going to get yeah, a lot of negativity his way because it's going to be, oh, we gave that contract to Harris, should have went with Butler, did all that. But – 
I, I'm I like Harris. I think he's a great player, and I'm excited for his. Uh, there's a five year deal for his full five years, if not six years, maybe. But uh, no, yeah, it's it's that's that's five, that's like, why I'm gonna that's why I'm gonna go Harris as well because he's got to live up to that contract at this point. Because mm-hmm. if he doesn't, he's gonna get a lot of backlash. Um, I also believe. Uh, Toby, we played him before uh, we started putting Simmons at the four. We played him some at the four, too, where he played a lot of the three with the Clippers. Um, so sometimes playing a different s- system in a different position you're not as accustomed to is going to bring some of your shooting and overall um, statistical numbers down a tad where you kind of saw that where next season that probably won't happen because if he knows – that's going to be assuming we have the same coaching staff, but he knows we're going to have, he's going to have a similar role. Uh, that's going to be a big adjustment uh, that he's going to be able to make too. So I think it's Tobias Harris because you can't pick against a guy that has a max contract unless if Josh Richardson just came in and was a world beater this year on offense and played great defense, <laughs> then I would have picked Josh Richardson. But that, that didn't happen. And also that's nothing, that's not even his own fault. He had injuries. He, he could have honestly been a lot more of a world beater because he was showing signs and would always get injured at once. Like every time it was, Oh my God, Josh Richardson's actually, sh-. then he, got, he just had the most unfortunate time. So, uh, he's a guy that I think is also going to step up, but more like you said, he's a guy that generates his offense normally from how much energy he generates in his game on the defensive end. And then that's what leads to him getting momentum to be good on the offensive end where Tobias Harris is normally a guy that gets going on the offensive end, and that's what kind of starts his momentum for his overall um, game more so, at least in my opinion. No, I, I agree with you 100%, and that's why it's it's going to be crazy. I can't wait for it because I'm, I'm very high and excited on the Sixers team and this this rebound, so uh, it's it's going to be fun to watch. Yeah, but, no, I, I completely agree. I, I You uh, – you started uh, moving me a little bit, but um, I mean, yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, I definitely going to agree with you that I think we're going to have a very solid player. I think Brokoff is a guy that could be a guy that if he's able to come down, we see him in some regular season games, like you said, could also have a chance to be that random guy that becomes an X factor. So that that's a good that's going to be a thing to say. But we're getting towards the uh, wrap up point here. So I was going to say if you want to share any of your handles and all that good stuff. Yeah. Uh, so my personal Twitter is aj underscore santangelo. Um, obviously, uh, to this wonderful podcast, um, which is true underscore Philly Sport for the Twitter. Joe will give you the Instagram. Um, and then I do at Pub Sports Radio baseball show Tuesday nights, uh, five central, six eastern. And then uh, one of my brothers at or at Philly underscore sports now. And I and then the one me and Joe also do chasing the pennant, uh, which can be found at A N Y P Phillies podcast. And I think that should be all of them. Sometimes yeah. I sometimes I forget <laughs> yes. forget I to throw do, one in. <laughs> I also do pub sports. I do Flyers nitty gritty with Jamie Bascal, who I had to decline a couple calls from and tell him I'll call him back in a second as we're wrapping this up. But I my Twitter is at JJ Borick twenty six. And um as Andrew said, true underscore Philly Sport for that Twitter, but it's spelled out true Philadelphia sportscast with a double S. So there's an S at the end of Philadelphia and then an S at the start of sports. So people know for spelling that out. And that's how it's spelled out on Instagram. I also um, do some stuff um, with Pure Low Wisdom on his uh, YouTube channel. So you can check me out there and all that stuff. So, But this has been True Philadelphian Sports Cast, the grittiest take. Let's go Sixers. We're ready to start kicking it and destroying it in the postseason. Ben is ripped. Joel's in the best shape <laughs> of his life somehow after <laughs> a three-month are. layoff. So we're ready to start destroying 16 it. 16 days away. Yeah. 16 days. Have a great day, everybody. Have a wonderful and blessed week. Peace out, everybody.